and that's really how I lead by by education, Jay. It's it's by positioning myself kind of downstream, where people who are interested in making money are in the right forums as me, and they're saying, "Hey, this is my problem. Is there anyone who can help me?" And so then you're in a in a conversation where it's not like you're begging, they're begging. It's a good product fit for everybody. And if you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor. Welcome to another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Conner, your host. This is the show where we talk about raising private money without even asking for money. Now, on this amazing show, my guest today, check this out. He has raised over $20 million in private money. And guess what? He has done it in a way that I bet you, you have never heard anybody else doing. In fact, I've been raising private money all the way since 2009, and I have never heard of anybody raising private money like my guest does. You know how he does it? He does it. He's raised over $20 million by using the WhatsApp app. Can you imagine attracting $20 million in private money by using the WhatsApp app, for goodness sake? Now, Part of his secret sauce that we're going to talk about, he leads with education. He leads with education, just like I do. So we're going to dive really deep in this episode as to how exactly he's done this. In just a moment, you're going to meet my very, very special guest, Mustafa Lada, right after this. Well, welcome to the show, Mustafa. Thank you so much, Jay. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, it is my honor and my pleasure to have you. Mustafa, my guess is you have a story that is somewhat similar to my story. And what I mean by that is I've discovered in interviewing, oh, over 600 episodes, guests here on the show, we all have something in common, and that is something happened in our career, something happened in our journey that triggered us. It was a pivotal moment. It was something that happened that caused us to now get into this world of private money. Myself, I've been investing in real estate full-time since 2003. The first six years, I relied on institutional money. I relied on the banks. And then in 2009, I lost all my lines of credit. That's what happened to me. I had to find a better and quicker way. Please share with us your story as to what happened and how you got into this world of raising private money. So first and foremost, Jay, before I answer the question, you look way too young to have done 300, 600. How, how many was it interviews? Um, over 600. You look way too young to have done over 600. So congratulations to you on that, Jay. So I think it's a very simple and, and great question. Anyone who's in real estate you talk to, they have a unique story that, you know, sometimes fundamentally comes down to like some stress factor or, the realization that they're not where they want to be in life. And I think that was the situation for me. Like early on, I graduated from college. I went to work, you know, in a pharmaceutical job in, in big pharma at Pfizer at the time. And very simply, it was, hey, if I do this job for the next, you know, 40 years, I retire at 65. What does life look like? Have I made enough money to live the life I kind of want to? And does delayed gratification really make sense and resonate with what I'm looking for ultimately? And if not, I need to figure out a way to make money. And that was kind of, you know, my journey from, from you know, graduating college to getting into the workforce to, to entrepreneurship. And then within entrepreneurship, it was, okay, what's the most scalable business? And what have what has historically been, you know, the most recession resistant? Like you mentioned, you know, starting in 2003, being in the real estate market in 2009, and, and continuing to invest, which, which indicates to a lot of listeners that real estate is that market that you want to be in long term. And you want to like, you know, plant the seeds now so that way it can, you know, grow into like a beautiful lawn that you can really enjoy. And I think that's, that's the situation with real estate for me. I looked at a lot of different businesses. I invested time and created a lot of different, you know, income streams. 
And real estate has always historically been the most scalable. And that's where I've, you know, doubled down. And, and like you mentioned in your, in your, you know, nice introduction, you know, I've had moderate success. I've done all right. But fundamentally, it's always been about adding value to people. And that's why I love, you know, podcasts like yours, just because people can learn so much. It doesn't really matter if they're raising capital, if they're not. It's just about understanding the different strategies that are out there and, and, and how that can help you scale ultimately. So you said something just a moment ago in your answer. And you talked about how real estate is, quote unquote, recession resistant. I want to dive into that for a moment because that really sounds counterintuitive, right? I mean, you, yeah. you, I mean, you know, you hear people saying, also, when's the next recession? Uh, when's the next bubble? When's the next crash? Uh, obviously, our economy has recessions. Yeah. Um, so how is it from your perspective? Obviously, I understand. I mean, I've already been through more than one cycle of up and down. Um, it's been my journey has been recession resistant. It has not been problem resistant, but it's been recession resistant. From your perspective, how is real estate recession resistant? I think it's a great question. And it's really simple, but it it really hits home to a lot of people, especially right now, depending on where you are in the economy, what job you have, et cetera. So fundamentally, a lot of us were kind of pitched this this dream or this this ideal, you know, from from elementary school till you graduate that like, oh, get an education, get a good job and you'll be OK. And in theory, that makes sense. But the fact of the matter is most Americans don't retire with enough savings to actually enjoy retirement. So then when you start to look at the data, there's a bit of a disconnect where, hey, if I get a good education, that's great. But that doesn't mean that I'm set. Um, if I get a good job at a good company, that's great. But that doesn't mean that company will necessarily look out for me with a pension or with, you know, a well-funded 401k or with a, a game plan that Mustafa is invaluable for the next 40 years. I'm only invaluable if I perform, which is fine with me. But then there can be some situations outside of your control, where, which is happening right now in the industry. You have, you know, tech layoffs, you have pharmaceutical industry layoffs. Um, and these are jobs that historically were doing very well in COVID. So it becomes a situation where to some degree you want to limit your, your risk. And, and in a lot of situations, we're told to just have one source of income, our primary W-2 job. And that can be very risky in a, in a challenging market. And that challenging market is typically referred to as like a recession where, you know, depending on your industry, you know, you can lose your job. So then it becomes, OK, hey, what am I going to invest in to mitigate my reliance, to limit my reliance on my W-2, on my sole income? Typically, people will go to the stock market. Typically, it'll be in the form of a 401k, which is better than not investing at all. The problem with that, from my perspective, is that the money is locked up typically until 65. So I want to say, OK, hey, how can I invest now? How can I build an income stream today that I can use for whatever I want? Because who knows if I'll make it to 65. And if I do, like, it's great to have money at 65. It's better to have money today. So if that's the mindset, Jay then it becomes, okay, let's look at entrepreneurship. Let's look at, you know, creating businesses. Let's look at generating revenue today. And then as you go through that, it becomes, okay, hey, how do we scale this? What's the most efficient way? And then depending on your answers, ultimately for a lot of people, for the average millionaire in the US, it comes down to real estate. And now the reason why to answer your question, Jay, the reason why I view real estate as, as a recession resistant is because it's all about the strategy. In real estate, a lot of times people tell you, you make money when you buy. And that's really critical because it means that you need to buy well. Think about it like today, you know, we're recording this in April and we're saying, hey, it's April, it's springtime. I'm going to go out and buy like shorts or something that's like seasonal. Those seasonal expenses are going to be more in demand now because we're entering a period of nicer weather, right? So the caveat would be like, hey, if you're doing a lot of shopping or whatever, you might wait until Black Friday where there's tremendous sales. And now the parallel to real estate would be we're in this environment of high interest rates where people are saying, hey, rates might drop. A year ago this time, they're saying rates are going to rise. Fundamentally, that question of rates can create angst or uncertainty in the market, and people might not be sure whether or not to invest. And so then it becomes when you're underwriting a deal, you want to understand, hey, am I buying right? 
and then the rates issue i'm underwriting for that and i'm saying hey rates are maybe a little bit higher than they are today just to be conservative and then you build out your strategy with your base assumptions and you say hey in 2024 rates are high versus 2022 but maybe over a 30-year period rates are kind of normal like they're not high they're not low they're about in the middle so if that's the lens and i'm a real estate investor investing for 30 years then I can't get caught up in the minutia of life because somebody is always going to be screaming doom and gloom. Somebody is always going to be screaming like, oh, hey, this is a very exciting time to get invested. You kind of want to be level headed and look at the data from my perspective, Jay. And I probably assume from your perspective as well, based on all the podcasts I've heard, that it's just about looking at the fundamentals and making a sound decision based on the numbers and then scaling from there, if that makes sense. Absolutely makes sense. Now, one thing I love about your philosophy, your approach, your mindset is that you attract private money. You don't chase like I don't chase. You attract private money by leading with education. In my uh, case, when I was cut off from the banks in 2009, I put my private lending program together. In other words, what was I going to offer <coughs> my potential private lenders? What kind of returns how they're protected without combining that with some particular deal. You know, it's interesting ever since I started raising private money, I've never asked anybody for money. I educate them. You know, the traditional way of borrowing money is you go to the bank or the hard money lender and you get on your hands and knees and you put your hands underneath your chin and you beg and you, you plead and you, and you know, you say, please fund my deal. And, you know, in this world, it's not about applying or asking for a mortgage. We're actually offering a mortgage, making a difference in other people's lives. Ordinary people, just like you and me, I've got 47 private lenders now that are loaning money on our deals. With that, my question to you, Mustafa, is specifically, how do you lead with education and then segue us into whenever the time is right. No, I'm not going to ask that question yet. Hold up. Don't go there yet. Ask, answer the question first. How do you lead with education? Sure. So I think fundamentally I approach life as um, I don't know what I don't know, Jay. So when I get into a conversation like today's, it's, hey, what can I learn from Jay and how can I add value to Jay? And, and you're asking a very great, you know, simple question of, hey, how do you attract investors? Fundamentally, it's about establishing trust establishing value for them and understanding what they want out of life. If you went up to anybody randomly on the street and you said, Hey, do you want to make money? Everyone would say yes, in my humble opinion, but do they trust you to make them money? No, because you haven't done anything to establish that relationship. And the thing is in a lot of situations, you're doing things out of altruism in some situations and, and to develop a relationship and to say, Hey, listen, I can add value for you here. I can talk to you about these strategies that I implement in my own life based on my experience and then, you know, use them if you want. You can invest in real estate through your retirement account. Most people don't know that. So now all of a sudden it goes from I don't have money to I have this annoying 401k that's not performing. Can Mustafa help me solve this problem? Now for you, Jay, that's a great solution because now you're private money lenders who ha are making maybe 5 to 8% in, in the stock market can now invest in your deals. And that's kind of what it comes down to because the same could be tread, said of a HELOC or of a life insurance policy or of liquid cash if the structure made sense. Um, and that's really how I lead by by education, Jay. It's, it's by positioning myself kind of downstream where people who are interested in making money are in the right forums as me. And they're saying, hey, this is my problem. Is there anyone who can help me? And so then you're in a, in a conversation where it's not like you're begging, they're begging. It's a good product fit for everybody. And, and, and you kind of mentioned a good example where you go to the bank or you go to a private mo money lender and you're applying and all of this. That's a great process. There's nothing wrong with it per se. It's just not how I do business. Um, and, and everyone does business differently, if that makes sense, Jay. It's just about figuring out how you can provide as much value at scale to people and then ultimately, sometimes that value that they want is they want a secure investment opportunity. And then it's about you positioning yourself, answering their questions. So that way they can understand whether or not you fit their needs. What you just said, uh, Mustafa, reminds me of this truth. 
And this truth is as follows. Desperation has a smell to it. Now, what I mean by that is I hear new real estate investors or even seasoned real estate investors that are looking to raise capital for the first time. And when they go out raising capital, they're asking for money. Well, if you're asking for money, where is your focus? Your focus is on you. Well, guess what? When your focus is on you first, you can't be leading with value. You know what you just said, Mustafa, is when you are leading with education, leading with a servant's heart, your focus is on them first, giving value first. So what's an example of that? The very first private lender luncheon, that meaning I just invited about 20 people in my own network that I know or knew. And uh, I bought them lunch and I, I didn't pitch a deal. I just, I taught them about self-directed IRAs that you just mentioned, Mustafa. <laughs> you earn high rates of return safely and yeah. safely, right? And so I raised without pitching a deal, I raised $969,000 at my very first private lender luncheon, educating people and giving them value first, right? And so this whole mindset of, Leading with education is just just so different. I think you like the phrase uh, desperation as a, as a as a I loved it. I <laughs> love the phrase because you know what it is? Like you and I both have a similar mindset of leading by education. But then when you're a bit pessimistic, you could say, "Oh, hey, he's only educating to raise capital." It's not really a funnel or any like, you know, malicious strategy. It just comes down to fundamentally you and I both appreciate somebody randomly cold calling us and adding value to our lives. Who doesn't appreciate that? But how many cold calls do you get that are from like some call center in China versus like exactly the pain point that I have? And that's the difference. Like um, to some degree, when we're out there raising capital, it's very easy to say, hey, I need to make rent that this month. I need to put food on my table. I need to, you know, buy a formula. Whatever, whatever your needs are, it's very easy to just focus on that. But fundamentally, the investor kind of realizes that not like overtly, but behind the scenes, they're like, like you mentioned with that desperation that it leads a sense. I think to some degree that like inner confidence that maybe you get from having a lot of deals done um, when you don't have that, it can be very difficult to get the first deal done. And because this podcast is, you know, for new and seasoned, you know, real estate investors, what I would say is, you know, not in a bad way, but fake it till you make it in the sense that if you believe in your product so much so that you're investing your own capital or that you're investing your own time, which in a lot of situations is worth more than my capital. Um, if that's the case, then you need to be able to communicate that to a potential investor in a way that doesn't reek of desperation. Like when I go to the BMW dealership, the Porsche dealership, whatever, you know, the salesman is going to be a little different potentially than like that used car salesman example where, they're like pitching me aggressively on how I need to buy this car today. And to some degree, that's what you want to kind of create, whether that's through education, which is how you and IJ prefer to do it, or through some other strategy, you want to position yourself that, hey, I have some skill set that can add value to others. So if other people realize that, they'll come to me and they'll ask me for advice, just like you'd go to a doctor and ask them, okay, what do you recommend? Or you'd go to a new restaurant and you'd ask a waiter, what's the best thing on the menu? that waiter may or may not have a higher net worth than you. It's not about money. It's about local ex experience. They're the best at knowing what's best on the menu for this restaurant. And that's why you're giving them that power to decide for you. And so that's kind of what you want to establish within the space of real estate or not even real estate, but your micro niche. If you're in multifamily like me, like ground up construction multifamily, if that's your niche, then that's what you focus on. And you say, hey, I'm very good at this. I'm happy to help you underwrite other deals, but this is my wheelhouse. And then it all scales from there, Jay. One phrase that you just said, um, Mustafa, was mindset. I tell people all the time, until you own the real estate between your ears, it's going to be hard to own real estate traditionally out there. And so I want us to dive in for a moment on mindset. And that is, we're not chasing, we're not begging, we're not selling, we're not persuading, all this leading with education. And another part of the mindset, and I want you to comment on this, uh, Mustafa, 
part of my mindset is if I ever feel like I'm starting to sell somebody on this world of becoming a private lender, I step back. In fact, all of the conversations I have, I sort of want to feel like I've got a foot in the back door getting ready to walk away because quite frankly, they need us. The private lenders need us more than we need them. And here's why. And that's not an arrogant statement. It's just a fact. There's so much more money out there than there are deals to tell you the truth. I've got a problem. I've got a million and a half dollars, what I call sitting on the shelf of unused private money, just waiting for me to deploy. I have a fun for you. Don't worry about it. Oh, yeah, you, 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 yeah, <laughs> yeah, you got a, you got a, you, you got a, a, a solution to my problem. I love Don't it. Worry. I'll, I'll take care of you offline, but continue. I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. So comment on that mindset of not having to sell or persuade. You sort of talked about it a second ago, the used car salesman versus, you know, the BMW, Mercedes, Rolls Royce, uh, right. you know, rep. Yeah. I think it's a great, it's a great point. And there's a fine balance. Like, you know, anyone watching this, like I can appear pretty serious on these, on these podcasts or in conversation. And so sometimes when, when I say something along the lines of, you don't, I don't need you, you need me, which can come across on calls. It can come off arrogant. And it's been very few times that I've gotten that feedback, but it's really pause, caused me to pause and take a step back. Cause that's not really my personality. I'm not really an arrogant person in my opinion of myself which could be arrogant, you know, itself. Um, but that being said, it's, Hey, like I always want to lead by, by creating value at the same time. Sometimes you meet a person who's kind of sucking the juice out of any deal, or they're taking all the profit off the table for everybody. And that's not how my deals are structured necessarily. It's everyone makes money together or money first. Um, but not like you make all the money or I make all the money. So that being said, you know, I got that feedback from, from somebody a couple of years ago that said, Hey, Mustafa, you know, when you first started raising capital on WhatsApp, I felt like, you know, there was this, you know, young, arrogant guy who's talking about a deal. Cause the way I structured it is very simply like, Hey, I'm investing 800 K on Friday. Today is Sunday. You're more than welcome to join me or you're more than welcome to watch. And it's a proof of concept fundamentally to, to position it that like, I don't need the money, but if you invest with me, we'll all make money together. And it'll be a great example of how we can all scale together. And, and that's how I positioned, you know, my first capital raise, Jay. And it was very simply to really focus on the educational piece and not to feel like I was selling people because like you mentioned and maybe alluded to, to some degree, we're in our own way a bit introverted where we want to work with people. We want to educate people. We want to help them, but we don't want to go around begging or asking or making other people feel uncomfortable because that would make us feel uncomfortable. So we always want a foot out the door a little bit to say, hey, you can invest in this structure. You can invest in this other structure or you can invest in no structure. And sometimes that can lead the person to be a little confused. And then it's like, no problem. I'm here to help you. I'm here to clarify the different options. But fundamentally, there's a lot of money out there and there aren't that many deals. But when you're asking for capital, people feel like you're desperate. And so it's about kind of clearly communicating that we're raising capital for this deal because this is the goal long term and this is what you can be a part of. At the same time, if it doesn't fit your parameters, if you're not sure about the risk profile, if you feel like, you know, we're going to default or whatever your concerns are, don't invest. I'll be around in five years, 10 years. You can circle back with me then and we'll have that same kind of conversation. And I've had that conversation with investors who three years ago didn't decide, decided not to invest and now they're investing. And what happened? They missed out on the opportunity cost of making double digit returns. Does that mean they'll make double digit returns in the future? No, because I can't guarantee performance that's illegal. And that's the type of conversation that I would have with investors to say, hey, listen, if you want information, more than happy to provide that. If you want testimonials or references, more than happy to provide that. Um, but it's not a situation where I can stop the deal just for you to decide to invest or not to invest. Or it's not the situation where I can you know, indefinitely move timelines. Sometimes the deal gets funded and people miss out. And that's sort of a byproduct of it being an amazing opportunity. But I'm not going to like beat you over the head with the fact that this is an amazing opportunity. I'm just going to say it once casually and move on. And that's typically how I address those things, Jay, if that makes sense. 
Mustafa, you just said something that got my attention. You just said that you have raised money on the WhatsApp app. How in the world? I've never heard anybody else say that. Now, I've heard people say, you know, put the word out. What are you doing on social media, et cetera? But you you got a niche right there. How in the world have you raised money on the WhatsApp? Yeah, so it's kind of like your it's kind of like your your luncheon example, right? So really it's about positioning yourself downstream, like I mentioned earlier. I think fundamentally everyone is looking to make money. There's loads of money out there, like you alluded to as well. So it's about positioning yourself on platforms where maybe there's less competition. Maybe you understand the mentality of people more to say, hey, people are always looking to make money. They can go to a coffee shop and meet somebody and invest. They can go to a luncheon to meet somebody and invest. Or they can meet somebody online, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on WhatsApp. So for me, what I did was I joined different networking groups on WhatsApp with the intention of investing and networking and growing, you know, their financial literacy. And on those platforms, I saw that there weren't really that many, There, you know, there were options that, that made sense to people, but I felt like we had a compelling case of maybe a structure that would be, you know, more advantageous for investors. So then it came down to taking that structure that was maybe only available to ultra high net worth individuals and really scaling it down to more of a crowdfunding type strategy. And that's really what I went around doing, saying, hey, this is a project that I'm working on. You're more than welcome to join me. And then in that first deal, I wasn't fortunate enough like you to raise 900K, but I raised, you know, a modest, a good, you know, 205K. And in that situation, those investors made 4.5% in three months. I returned all their principal and their profit. And then I said, hey, guys, if you want to do this again, we'll launch a fund. It'll be a one year minimum investment and uh, we'll get started on, you know, scaling the portfolio. And that 200K that I returned with profit, they then invested a million. And then that scaled to now over 30 million that I managed just, just on WhatsApp. And uh, so, I, you know, I've been decently fortunate enough. I've had a good performance, things of that nature. But, but fundamentally to, to, your, to the heart of your question, it's just about understanding people's mentality and seeing, you know, what value you can add for them. And then as you add value, they feel comfortable scaling as well. So two questions. You know, the the profile of the average Facebook um, user is one thing. A LinkedIn user, a TikTok user, an Instagram user. Um, how would you describe the WhatsApp people? I, I don't know in the sense that it's like, how would you describe a coffee person, right? They could be going to Starbucks. They could be going to Dunkin'. It's different. So fundamentally, like when you, when you talk to somebody or when you're advising somebody who's getting started, right? Like you're in the capital raising business for years, you have much more experience and you're better looking than I am. Right? So when, when you advise somebody, you would say, Hey, start with friends and family. I did not start with friends and family. Right. The way I started was, hey, who's looking to make money? Who are the people that are most aggressively looking to make money and where are they hanging out? In this situation, I came across a network of people on WhatsApp that literally have their own virtual coffee stores talking about making money. Those are the groups that I joined. And now when they're talking about money, I'm looking at it like, oh, hey, they're not making that much money, in my opinion. So how do I have that conversation in a respectful way? So by educating, by saying, hey, here's a different strategy. Um, and that's really what I did by leading by, by, by example, by showing the value, and then ultimately by scaling those relationships with proof of concept. And then it's like, okay, hey, no one's talking about having a fund admin on their other investments. Let me have a fund admin. Hey, no one's talking about audited financials. Let me talk. Let me add audited financials. Let me make this an institutional grade product to the best of my ability for retail investors. That way, before any competition can even develop, it's that, hey, this guy has had five years, 10 years of track record, and he has all of this. So now to compete like a new product doesn't have that double digit track record for five plus years. They don't have the audited financials. They don't have a fund admin. They don't have all these different plus points. So it becomes harder to some degree for a new product to compete with mine in that one micro niche. And then at the same time, it becomes 
hey, everybody is still working. They're still making money. They're still looking to invest. And because they've had good performance, good track record, good communication, they're comfortable, you know, referring you to others. And that's how it scales. And I think that's the thing. And it's probably similar for you, Jay, except the only thing was instead of a virtual setting, it was in person. And I think it's also a, a changing of the times to some degree in 2024 to raise capital online is no longer unique. To raise capital on WhatsApp, I, I agree. I don't think many people are doing it. I don't know of any other people that are really doing it at scale. But that doesn't mean that it's the best strategy or the right strategy. I think the right strategy is as a capital raiser, because I know this is also for, for new capital raisers, this podcast, what I would do is I would say whatever feels natural to you, that's where you should be raising money. If you know you enjoy being on WhatsApp, raise money on WhatsApp. If you enjoy Twitter, do Twitter. If you enjoy raising money at you know the racetrack, do that or the pickleball court. Whatever it is, whatever you know your preferences are, that's where you should be making you know meaningful connections because it's not really. A lot of people think it's a numbers game, but to me, it's about like building the depth of relationships because that one investor that you know starts out at 10k, he might be a multi-million dollar or a million dollar investor for you. You just have to establish proof of concept for him and then he'll scale with you and he'll happily scale with you. And I think that's the difference, you know, from my perspective, Jay, that there's no one right way to raise capital. It's just whatever feels right to you, the capital raiser. That is so intriguing, Mustafa. So intriguing. I appreciate you sharing that, particularly about the WhatsApp. Um, a few topics we didn't have time to cover. I want to cover right now very quickly. Sure. And that is we talked about self-directed IRAs um, of the 47 private lenders that we have investing in our deals. Over half of those 47 private lenders are using their retirement funds. Beautiful. And you know what's interesting? None of them ever heard of self-directed IRAs until I put on my teacher hat and I started teaching them. So I, I just want the audience to know this, particularly those that are listening that are interested in being a passive investor, let Mustafa do all the work. You just invest the money and Mustafa will give you a high rate of return safely and securely. You can use your retirement funds. And if you don't know how to do that, Mustafa can teach you how to do that. You can also use life insurance. You can use life insurance to invest in real estate. Mustafa can teach you how to do that. You also can use HELOCs. You can use home equity lines of credit to invest in real estate. That's called arbitrage. And I love it because that's got an infinite rate of return. If you'd like to learn how to get an infinite rate of return by leveraging the bank's money, talk to Mustafa about that. So I'm leading into Veloce Capital. Veloce Capital, Mustafa. Tell the audience about Veloce Capital and why they would want to learn about that. Sure. So Veloce Capital, we're based in New Jersey. We invest a lot in New Jersey, a lot in Baltimore, Maryland, and Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and fundamentally, we're a private real estate investment firm. We have a lot of different strategies for investors. Really, it comes down to your goals, right? If you're somebody who's looking to make money monthly, there's an income fund that can help you do that. If you're looking more for long-term wealth, maybe with a short investment period of minimum two years, there's a strategy for that. And if you're looking for you know, tax savings and you know, more generational wealth, you're somebody who's a high income earner. There's you know different strategies for that. And fundamentally, it comes down to you and your goals, because like we mentioned in that coffee example, there's no you know, one best place to get coffee per se. It depends on your preferences. It's the same with real estate. Real estate is a vehicle and you want that vehicle to be in alignment with your goals. So it's a really intimate conversation to say, hey, this is how I want to make money. And then I say, OK, hey, this is a structure. Does it make sense? Does it resonate? And then accordingly, we really build that out for you. And ultimately, it's customized based on your needs. So if you'd like to learn how to be a passive real estate investor by being a investor in Veloce Capital, go to www.velocecapital, spelled V-E-L-O-C-E, capital.com. And of course, that will be in the show notes as well. Mustafa, thank you so much. You and I are definitely aligned in our philosophy and how we go about attracting money without asking for money by leading with education. Thank you so much for joining me. No, it was my pleasure. Thank you again and have a good one.
You got it. There you have it. Another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority. And if you happen to be watching on YouTube, be sure and subscribe and ring that bell so you don't miss out on any other of the upcoming episodes. And of course, if you're listening on your favorite podcast, be sure and follow so you don't miss out. I look forward to seeing you on the very next episode of Raising Private Money with Jay Connor. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jconnor.com slash money guide. That's jconner.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconnor.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with J.